go into the world. And tell every man that you meet, there is a man on the cross. A Catholic take. What you need to know right now. A bold synthesis of inspiration and information. Keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous Catholic perspective. A Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and it's great to be on with you. Praise be to God. Can you believe it's already July 1st? I mean, like, what in the world? How did it happen so fast? But we are already in July now. Praise be to God. And it's now the month of the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, fact check me on that one, uh, Producer Jake. But I'm pretty sure that uh, we, we celebrate that this week, and uh, I'm glad for it, too. Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano argues that he is not in schism. He, in fact, argues the other way, that it, Pope Benedict XVI, or Pope Francis, rather, is, uh, is in schism. It's a nuanced approach here, but I think it's important for us to understand the nuance in this argument because I believe that the impact is greater, is greater when you really look at what Carlo Maria Vigano is actually saying. So to have that conversation, we've invited Dr. Anthony Stein on the team to be here at 14 past the hour to give us the summary cliff notes from a very long rebuttal from Archbishop Maria Vigano to the charges at the Vatican that he is spreading schism. And again, I think we'll emphasize the timing of all of this. I find that incredibly fascinating. Dr. Anthony Stein from Return to Tradition will join us at 14 past the hour. And then we're going to also going to be talking about the USCCB's layoff, the USCCB laying people off uh, to the tune of 50%, like from the Social Justice Department, really? Like, why? why? Why are they doing that? We'll have a conversation with... Michael Hitchborn from Lepanto Institute at 30 past the hour to discuss that as well. Lots of stories in the news that are of great concern. And uh, some are calling that uh, Joe Biden will actually be bailing out of the race soon. Is that true? I don't know. We'll probably get into some of that as well. But don't forget to sign up for the new conference coming up August the 25th in Niagara Falls. I'm going to be there. Looking forward to seeing you there, too. Go to the station of the cross.com, click on that banner to get the details. And don't forget, there are hotel discounts available to you as well. The station of the cross.com. Let's pray. Let's get started. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O mother of the word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and now your saint of the day. Saint Gaspar del Bufalo, missionary of the most precious blood, pray for us. St. Gaspar's feast is usually celebrated on October 21st, but his devotion to the precious blood of Christ, including his founding of the order called the Missionaries of the Most Precious Blood, played a major role in the promotion of today's feast of the most precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. This feast dates back several centuries on local calendars and was extended to the whole church by Pope Blessed Pius IX. In the modern calendar, it is missing merged into the venerable feast of Corpus Christi, which is renamed the Body and Blood of Christ. The assumption, however, that the existence of these two feasts unnecessarily splits or duplicates devotion to the Blessed Sacrament ignores the rich nature of today's feast. This day honors the precious blood as the source of redemption for mankind, not only under the appearance of wine at Holy Mass, but in every way that the blood is depicted. It is presented for a special devotion throughout Holy Scripture, particularly by St. Paul, and by St. John, who vividly describes the precious blood washing mankind clean from sin. Christian art, music, and literature have echoed the apostles in this regard since the earliest days of the Church. Thus, today's feast resembles that of our Lord's Sacred Heart, honoring a great and specific aspect of devotion to Christ's passion and the divine love and mercy of the Redeemer. For more about this day and others in the Church's calendar, visit thestationofthecross.com slash saintsandseasons. Most precious blood of Jesus, wash over us. St. Gaspar del Bufalo, missionary of the precious blood, pray for us. 
And now your headline news. The New York Post is reporting dozens of migrants who violently stormed El Paso border crossing were released into the United States. It's the latest shocking gut punch to accountability after 211 migrants were caught on video by the Post rushing toward the U.S. border and attacking Texas National Guardsmen who tried to turn them back to Mexico. At least one migrant was seen stomping on the service member's knee during the melee. The migrants accused of taking part in the riot were then released from the state custody and handed over to ICE, which set 43 of them free, a spokesman said. ICE releases migrants into the U.S. because they can't deport them fast enough and because authorities need to make room in the detention centers for the worst of the worst, according to the same source. Texas authorities labeled nine of these migrants as ringleaders of the riot and intended to file felony rioting charges, but two of them were released by the Border Patrol soon after. ITV is reporting world's first carbon tax on agriculture costs farmers 75 pounds per cow. It is the world's first carbon emissions tax on ag. The move has angered some farmers. Denmark is a major dairy and pork exporter, and agriculture is the country's biggest source of emissions. The tax, expected to be approved by Denmark's parliament later this year, will amount to 300 krone, or about 35 pounds per ton, of CO2 equivalent emissions from livestock from 2030. It gets up. It goes more expensive from there, by the way. It comes just months after farmers held protests across Europe, blocking roads with tractors and pelting the European Parliament with eggs over over a long list of grievances, including gripes about environmental irregulation and excessive red tape. And Ground News is reporting several U.S. military bases in Europe have been put on heightened state of alert. U.S. Army garrison in Stuttgart, Germany, under U.S. European command, raised alert status to Charlie for readiness against potential threats. Multiple U.S. bases in Europe heightened alert due to terrorism concerns to include Aviano Air Base in Italy, as well as Stuttgart and others. I used to live in Stuttgart, so yikes. Those, those are your headline news. The gospel comes to us from Matthew chapter 8, verses 18 through 22. When Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other shore. A scribe approached and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus answered him, Foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. Another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. But Jesus answered him, Follow me and let the dead bury their dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Haydock's Catholic Bible Commentary today said, By the fox is meant craft, and cunning by the birds pride thus then our lord uh, then our blessed lord answered him pride and deceit dwell in your heart but you have left no place for the son of man to rest his head who can rest only in the meek and the humble quoting saint augustine there jesus christ rejected this scribe because he wished to follow jesus rather through the desire of glory and wealth, hoping to be great in his kingdom, than with the design of perfecting himself in virtue, so that our Savior answers him, You cannot expect riches from me, who am poorer than the beasts of the field or birds of the air. They have a place of rest, whereas I have none. The first words, Hadok goes on to say, Let the dead cannot mean those that were dead by a corporal death, and therefore must needs to be understood of those who were spiritually dead in sin. Two similar answers are mentioned in Luke nine fifty seven and 60. Jesus Christ may have given the same answer on two different occasions. God will not suffer us to go and bury a deceased parent when he calls us to other employments, according to St. Chrysostom. 
Father McKeevenly says, Our Redeemer, without either accepting or refusing his offer, and seeing the interested views by which he was very probably ac- uh, actuated, tells him if he expected in Christ's kingdom worldly glory or wealth, he was greatly mistaken. Similar was his reply to the mother of the sons of Zebedee in, in uh, chapter 20, verse 22, and the young man mentioned in chapter 19, verse 21. So you got to make a choice. You got to let go of this world. This world does not have a solution and offering for us for the rest of eternity. The kingdom of God does. But in order to get there, we have to be willing to die to self and to this world. We cannot be friends of the world if it's not to convert the world. If it's to just be like the world, to be as materially focused as the world is, then we are gravely mistaken. Hadock goes on to say, suffer the dead, i.e. those who are dead in infidelity and sin to bury their dead, i.e. whose souls are by death separated from their bodies. Hence the word dead bears a different signification in both cases. In the first place, it means spiritually dead, suffer the dead who are only concerned about the present world and never think of following Christ. In the second, to bury their dead, those corporally dead, St. Luke uh, chapter 9, verse 60 says, Our Lord added, But go thou and preach the kingdom of God. For these words of St. Luke, we see that if two incompatible duties occur, we must attend to the more necessary and important. You must make a choice. Whose team are you on? This world or on the Lord's? You have to choose. We all do. Make your choice today. And we'll be right back. Let's talk about Vigano coming up next. Don't go anywhere. Hey, everybody. It's Raymond Arroyo. I want to invite you to a very special event. On August 24th, I'm going to be at the Niagara Falls Convention Center celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Station of the Cross. I hope you'll come out. I'm speaking with a slew of other incredible speakers. We'll meet in person. I'll sign your books. It's going to be a great day. Go to stationofthecross.com, stationofthecross.com for tickets and all the details. And I hope to see you then. Bye now. All right, guys, it's Candace Owens, and I have some exciting news. The Station of the Cross has their 25th anniversary celebration, which is taking place on August 24th, 2024, at Niagara Falls Convention Center in Niagara Falls, New York. This is going to be a two-part event, including a general day event with speeches from myself and other Catholic speakers, plus a VIP gala dinner. So if you want to hear my journey to the Catholic faith, I hope that you will meet me there. You can do that by registering for this event at thestationofthecross.com. You might even have the chance to meet me there. That's thestationofthecross.com. I look forward to seeing you guys. I'm going, and I hope you'll go too. Go to again to the uh, stationofthecross.com, click on that banner, and you can find the details on the conference, the gala, dinner as well. Great opportunities to get to uh, meet Bishop Strickland there. Father Mateg is going to be there. Mother Miriam is going to be there. I'm going to be there. Producer Jake, of course, Candace Owens, and Raymond DeRorio, thestationofthecross.com. Lots of stories in the news that are of great concern to us, and I'm sure they are to you as well. And uh, the Archbishop Maria Vigano story is just getting more interesting by the day. We've invited Dr. Anthony Stein on the team from Return to Tradition to be here to give us the cliff notes from a very long rebuttal to the charges laid against him at the Vatican. Dr. Stein, good morning to you. Thank you for your time. Good morning, and thanks for having me on again. <laughs> One of the things that I've been saying is about the Vigano story is it's not, it's, it's, you know, just, just calling him a set of a contest, in my opinion, is missing a lot. It's too, it's too simple. His argument is way more nuanced, and I would argue – has greater implications than just simply being a set of a contest. What do you say? Well, I agree completely. The a set of a contest is typically not going to appeal to the bishops of and the cardinals of the Roman Curia to adjudicate an issue as important as this, because set of a contest rather famously don't believe any of the sacraments of the post conciliar church are valid, or they are dubious at best. That is what the set of a contest believe. Archbishop Vigano has never said anything to imply that he holds that position. Never at one time. 
said anything. I know because yeah. I've read virtually every letter he's written in the last six years. <laughs> this is a very lengthy response that he's has issued. I think it was on Friday, if I'm not mistaken. You did a great video on it on Saturday. I know Taylor Marshall did as well as probably others. But uh, he's basically saying, it, correct me if I'm wrong here, but he's basically saying that it's not that uh, it's not just that uh, Pope Francis was, um, you know, not canonically elected properly, but that he's an anti-pope. Again, I think that has mm. much greater implications than just pure set of a contism. He is saying he is a he is a, a false and a fake pope. That's a bigger deal. How do you think it's going to impact those Catholics who find themselves in that sort of gray zone here about the current uh, crisis in the church? I have seen over the past few years increasing numbers of Catholics at least entertain the idea, but others get repelled completely by it. And I've seen in the aftermath of Vigano's recent letters where he's out and out saying this, some people say that they were done with him, but others say that they were finally glad somebody was saying it. I think you're going to see the polarization in traditionalist and conservative Catholic circles grow because of this actually, which is unfortunate, but I think that's what you're going to see as the most likely consequence of this. It is divisive. I think that's what you were saying there. It is very divisive. There's a lot of trad Catholics that no longer support Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano as a result, as a result to, to his position, his stance. I myself am not a set of a contest, and yet we find ourselves in a very difficult and precarious position. And again, that nuanced position of Carlo Maria Vigano being that uh, he claims that Pope Francis is not just not not properly the Pope, but he's not even Catholic. That's a that's a much, much bigger and greater argument. But I also can't uh, ignore the fact that the timing is very suspect in all of this because he's been saying these things for a while now. It's not like he just started last week and they're like, oh, you can't say that. So now we got to do something about it. This has been years in the making, so why now? Um, why, why all of a sudden? What, and I know you've talked about this quite a bit on your channel. Well, my assertion is that back in May, Archbishop Vigano accused Pope Francis of, being, of committing crimes like Ted McCarrick. Mm. He said that he had seminarians who attested to this. The response initially from a lot of people was that he needs to bring proof. I'm one of those who believes he needs to bring proof. I think he will eventually. The process against him was started in early May. He made this assertion in mid to late May. But famously, the wheels of justice and everything else in the Vatican move rather slowly. But this accelerated. This was the fastest movement I've ever seen. To give you an idea, uh, Father Marco Rupnik, guilty of things that I can't bring myself to say out loud, aside mm. from um, coercing nuns to commit vile, unspeakable acts with him of a sexual nature and then absolving them of their sins in the confessional, thus incurring automatic excommunication. The process against him is moving at a snail's pace, or rather at a normal Vatican pace. But they accelerated with Vigano, combined with the rumored crushing of the diocesan Latin mass that's supposed, supposedly happening in the next two weeks mm -hmm. and other things going on, including, I don't know if you've heard this story, but there had been talks with the Anglicans and behind the scenes and conservative Anglicans are considering coming into communion with Rome because the Vatican will not require them to be on the same page dogmatically about wow. things like holy orders and the Eucharist, sacrificing truth for unity. Wow. That's, again, that's terrible. It, it, it's 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 absolutely terrible because again, the only heresy that matters are those heresies against the current order of things, against the current orthodoxy, the new ecclesiology, the synodal church, and the only people ever accused of heresy and schism are those rigid traditionalists. And Vigano is a great stand-in for that because, for whatever reason, they think he's the leader of traditional Catholicism. There is no leader of traditional Catholicism. We would be better off if we had one, somebody that every, virtually every traditionally minded Catholic could rally around, but there is not a figure like that. Cardinal Burke is divisive. Cardinal Seurat is divisive. Bishop Schneider is divisive. All of them are, but, sh but mm. none of them are nearly as divisive as Vigano. He's a good straw man for them to put in as a stand-in. 
Now, especially all the with Cardinals, some of the reports, as far as I know, all of the Cardinals all accept Pope Francis as a legitimate Pope and successor in the chair of St. Peter. So there's the other issue is 100% of the Cardinals and the, let's just say the vast majority of bishops around the world, and as far as I know, 100% of all governments all recognize Francis as the successor of St. Peter in the chair. So that, uh, I think, makes the 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 argument, I mean, in my opinion, anyway, it's part of the reason why I'm not a set of a contest. And yet here we are. We find ourselves in this. Now, let me ask you this question. So the argument that Carlo Maria Vigano is making about uh, Pope Francis being an anti-pope, we have seen that in history before. Yes. I mean, there, he's not the first anti-pope. At one point, it was about an, uh, an average of one anti-pope for every eight papacies. <laughs> That's what it was at one point, the average. is one, uh, one commentary I saw on this. It's just that we haven't had one in a long time. Mm. The most, I mean, the last anti-pope, I think, was in the Great Western Schism, if I'm not mistaken. But Vigano is not asserting that he's an anti-pope in the traditional sense of an anti-pope, where there you have two figures competing for the claim, the rightful claim to the papacy. He is essentially claiming that the revolution in the church started with the Masonic takeover of the church, uh, Vatican II. That's what he's saying. That the church, that the what hat came after was the church being the champion of the French Revolution's values. It's a not a new accusation. Traditionalists have been making a, I would say, usually a more moderated t- in terms of t- language employed, but the same kind of accusation for 60 years. It's that Vigano is, if you can 100% say he's guilty of anything, it's his either his un- inability to or unwillingness to use diplomatic language to describe the situation in the church, which is ironic for a formal papal nuncio. Do you see this getting um, worse in the church? I, I find that this is just one more step towards a like a, an internal civil war, and we're going to feel we're going to feel the pinch of that in our parishes. It's going to be father against son, mother against daughter. It's it, we're, I think Catholics are going to be labeled schismatic and uh, and uh, and worse, you know, excommunicated. I think those terms are going to be used. They're just going to fly around the place, all over the place, and all the time. And Catholics are going to get sort of get numb to those terms. Do you see that day coming? Yes, especially if this Latin mass ban is true, if it does come down as rumored, and if that's not deemed enough. Because people forget that groups like the FSSP and others like them, the FSSP have gone out of their way to say that they are not a traditionalist group, that they are dedicated to the traditional sacraments. But they are, you know, ecclesiologically, they believe to be on board with everything going on. But those groups exist at the whim of the Vatican. They simply do. And they operate in every diocese on the whim of the local ordinary. We have seen, especially in France, the FSSP, Institute of Christ the King, be kicked out of dioceses on the whim of the local ordinary. The Institute of Christ the King sovereign priest had a Famously, this past weekend, give up a ancient parish of some kind in France, turned it back over to the or- the ordinary, and was kicked out. This could be the, the way this plays out as part of the bigger picture of things going on will determine what happens next on the traditional Catholicism and conservative Catholicism side of things versus everything else going on. And I, I hate using terminology like that, but it, we, there is a divide in the church. The church is polarized right now. And people, yeah. there are people who would like to pretend that's not the case. But unfortunately, oh, oh, you should be at least case. aware of things coming, going, coming on. Otherwise, you might be caught, you might be blindsided when things come down. Do you think, I mean, Vigano seems to think that the conclusion of this trial is a foregone conclusion, and that is that he'll be labeled an uh, excommunicated for, you know, pushing schism onto the, the the faithful. Do you see that outcome as being sort of obvious? Yes, I mean that seems obvious. Yeah, I would expect. I would be surprised if in the next few days you didn't get a ruling from the Vatican on this. Wow. Especially since he's opted not to show up. That's something. Last time you and I talked about it, according to the reports, he was he was show he had shown up, but it had been clarified after that in fact he didn't show, and uh, was misrepresented in the media. The National Catholic Reporter, I think, was 
uh, one of those outlets, or the America Magazine, maybe it was. But uh, at any rate, America. Dr. Anthony Stein, I really appreciate your summarizing this case for us. It's kind of a big deal. Uh, to All Catholics should be paying attention to this. And uh, Archbishop Carl Maria Vigano's argument isn't as simple as just, you know, set of a contism. It goes way deeper and bigger than that. So thank you for your time today, Dr. Stein. Thank you. If you got time to hang out with us after in the after show, we'd love to have you back. But you can go to returntotradition.org for his uh, his website, for his show notes. But go to his YouTube channel if you haven't done so already and check that out. Coming up after the break, Michael Hitchborn is on the team from Lepanto Institute. Let's talk about why exactly USECB laid off 50% of their social staff. Let's talk about that next. Don't go anywhere. Join us on Saturday, August 24th at the Niagara Falls Convention Center for a historic event, the 25th anniversary celebration of the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network. You'll be inspired by our all-star lineup of renowned speakers, Raymond Arroyo, Candace Owens, Bishop Joseph Strickland, Mother Miriam, Father Robert McTagg, Jim Havens, and Joe McLean. Don't miss the chance to hear all these fantastic speakers at the general event. But wait, there's more. Register for the VIP gala dinner and mingle with all the guest speakers over hors d'oeuvres, cocktails, and a fabulous sit-down dinner. Plus, enjoy special bonus talks by Raymond Arroyo and Candace Owens. Tickets are limited, so secure your spot today at thestationofthecross.com. Thank you for celebrating our 25-year anniversary with us. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and here are your headline news. Epic Times reports the U.S. Supreme Court is set to release a ruling on Trump immunity case today. The U.S. Supreme Court is scheduled to release its final opinions today, the final day of the court's current term. The most significant and controversial decision involves whether former President Donald Trump should be declared immune from prosecution in relation to election-related criminal charges brought by special counsel Jack Smith. CBS is reporting increasing numbers of voters don't think Biden should be running after the debate with Trump, according to a new CBS poll. After President Joe Biden turned in a dismal debate performance last week, a CBS News and YouGov poll found 72 percent of registered voters do not believe the 81-year-old incumbent has the mental and cognitive health to be president. Among Democratic registered voters, 41 percent say Biden does not have the capacity to do the job, a 10-point increase over the 29 percent who said the same earlier in June. However, it uh, looks like the Biden family got together at, uh, in Maine at their retreat house in Maine to discuss what's going to happen next. They want to continue on. However, BillOReilly.com is reporting the decision has been made that the president will quit the campaign. Two reasons. Democrat internal polling says he cannot recover from the debate and fundraising is drying up. I don't know. We're going to find out, I suppose. Catholic Vote is reporting Christian leaders blast Jerusalem's new tax on churches. Christian leaders in Jerusalem are speaking out against Jerusalem's officials' decision to impose municipal taxes on church properties. We declare that such a measure both undermines the sacred character of Jerusalem and jeopardizes the church's the church's ability to conduct its ministry in the land on behalf of its communities. And the worldwide church. Are you is. Are we okay with the Israelis taxing our churches? I don't know. I'm not. Those those are your headline news. Praise be to God. Hey, last week we saw this this uh, headline about the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops laying off 50 percent of their social justice staff. We did report on that, but we wanted to invite Michael Hitchborn to be on the team today to talk about the fallout of this decision. Michael Hitchborn, good morning, and thanks for uh, being on the team today. It's always good to be back and talking to you about this kind of stuff, Joe. The USCCB, now this is something you and I have talked about a number of times on the show. Um, Let's talk first about the debate that happened at the most recent meeting of the USCCB. So they get together, they're debating. I think it's not in the general session, but it was, wasn't it like a separate meeting, a separate little 
a little meeting they had a debate over whether or not to keep the CCHD. Tell me about that. Well, what what happened within the internal proceedings uh, is it, it's kind of confusing because there's there are different reports talking about what happened. But what we do know, uh, at least according to the National Catholic Reporter, so take that for what it's worth, um, <laughs> is that uh, Bishop Paprocki and uh, Archbishop Nauman both stood up and said, hey, I think it's time to sunset the Catholic Campaign for Human Development. We can convert the uh, the department into something different. Bishop Paprocki proposed that it be converted to a collection for Catholic education, which I think is a fantastic idea considering the exorbitant cost of Catholic education nowadays. Um, and uh, then, of course, the National Catholic Reporter indicated that Cardinal Tobin stood up and made a powerful defense of the CCHD and that subsequent (laughs) bishops, unnamed bishops, uh, echoed that defense. What's ironic is that, and and this is not something that you and I had prepared to talk about this morning, but I'll throw it in here. What's ironic is that Cardinal Tobin is the one who is allowing a radio station that he is responsible for to broadcast satanic music. So, uh, if he's going to turn a blind eye to that kind of thing, you can imagine what he's turning a blind eye to with regard to the CCHD. Yeah, we did talk about that. I think when uh, when that story broke is the satanic radio station, the, the death metal radio station in his diocese yep. that gets a pass. Uh, CCHD also getting a pass. The, so I guess give us the, the cliff notes again, just even though we've talked about it four billion times. CCHD. What are their biggest? What are the? What are our biggest grievances against the CCHD? Well, uh, how long do we have? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, so the, the the CCHD was set up to fund Saul Alinsky's community organizing groups, which is a huge knock against it to begin with. Saul Alinsky was a Marxist. Uh, he set up community organizing groups to foment. Marxist revolution within the United States. Uh, It's all built around envy. It's built around um, revolutionary ideologies. And uh, nothing is ever going to be accomplished through Saul Alinsky's community organizing groups that is a good thing. So that's, that's knock number one. Knock number two is that a lot of the CCHD grantees, at least 30, 33% every year since I've been tracking what they've been funding, are directly involved in the promotion of abortion, contraception, homosexuality, Marxism, you name it. Uh, so it's, it's consistently funding the enemies of the cross of Christ, and uh, that's not what we as Catholics ought to be financing. Yeah, yeah, we shouldn't. We shouldn't have anything to do with these things, but they... It, at least it appears to me, correct me if I'm wrong, but they just, they are kind of addicted to that government funding. Well, so CCHD isn't, isn't attached to government funding. That would be like Catholic Charities or Catholic Relief mm-hmm. Services. CCHD is all driven by pew-sitting Catholics. Um, if we, we don't know for sure exactly how much is taken in the CCHD collection. Uh, that's not really reported uh what we do know is what they spend every year. So the question is, well, are, how much are they getting? How much are they spending? How does that work out? And um, what we do know now is that uh, they've been overspending by about $7 million every year. Say that again. So it looks like CCHD funding has dropped. So the faithful are kind yep. of tired of giving to these things. Uh, yep. Thanks in large part to your efforts and the Lepanto is, uh, Institute's efforts to report on these issues. And they are compensating the lack of funds from other mm-hmm. other buckets, right? They have to have. And, and uh, there was some sort of they, – they list CCHD assets, what those assets are, if, if that's just money in the bank or if they're investments or I, – I, I don't know what those assets are. They don't say. But uh, they do say – do indicate that they had assets – valued around $60 million as far back as 2012. Uh, and then that has dropped to almost nothing by 2024. So wouldn't that signal something to the bishops that the lay faithful don't want to put up with this? They're, they're really not interested in, in participating with these, with these groups. So why not pivot towards, hey, guys, from now on, we're only going to work with 
other Catholic entities that that hold our values and believe what we believe, and they're not going to conflict with us in a moral or ethical or any other teaching. Why don't they just do that? Why do they insist to continue to work with these very nefarious groups that you've reported on so many times? Well, I, I think the question has to be asked, why was this allowed to to be instituted to begin with? Uh, so if anybody has ever read Saul Alinsky, Rules for Radicals is predicated on the ends justifies the means, which is a completely anti-Catholic ideology. Uh, can, you know, you, you look at the... Uh, the educational elements of his, uh, his progeny and all of them teach, this is how you organize and how you organize is built around the ends, justifying the means, just do whatever it takes in order to get what you want. And, um, for any Bishop to, I, I can't see the bishops being ignorant of what Saul Alinsky was setting up and how he was, uh, instructing the poor to take what they want. So why they would go ahead and say, just do, do this, fund this, finance this, uh, I don't understand that. And I, I don't know that it's defensible on a Catholic level. Okay, so what are they saying about laying off 50% of their social justice staff? Well, how are they describing that layoff versus what we're sort of reading between the lines here and saying, well, clearly lack of funding, the voice of the lay faithful sort of ringing out against these issues. Maybe they're just they're, they, they, they realize they can't. This isn't sustainable. and They can't keep going this way. So they're laying the folks off. What are they saying about it? They're not saying much. Uh, what we do know. Uh, a June 25th letter went out that explained that recent layoffs at the conference affected three out of six of the department's personnel designated for the CCHD. And, and then if you go to the USCCB's website, uh, even though it still identifies Ralph McLeod as uh, the executive director of the CCHD, so they're not even mm. updating their own website, but um, there are about six active positions. There's the assistant director, the grants administrator, and then you've got uh, four Grant specialist uh, area E is is vacant, so I guess it's been vacant for a while. But uh, it looks like they're going to be eliminating three out of those six positions. Now, I don't know if that means they're just laying off the personnel and they'll fill the spots later, which would indicate that there was a problem with the personnel themselves, or if it means they're just going to eliminate the positions and uh, reinvigorate what they're trying to do in each it, it, by consolidating those positions. I have no idea. You know, I was having a conversation yesterday uh, with some, some great Catholic gentlemen. And one of the questions that kind of comes up a lot whenever I have these sort of these private conversations, but Joe, we've had bad times in the history of the church before what makes today any different. And one of the things that comes up is like, okay, you got Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano claiming that the Pope isn't an actual Catholic. Like let that's the gravity of his are of, of the argument. It's kind of a big deal. And then, of course, you've got the U.S. bishops defending groups that are so contrary to what we believe as Catholics. It is a blasphemy and an offense against God. But they're defending these groups and giving our donated dollars to these groups in the name of what? It's just it's mind boggling. Like I can't think of another time in history where that is is the case, it does feel like things are really, really uh, different these days. Do you see it that way, Michael Hitchborn? <laughs> oh, I mean, not only is the moral element of the time completely unique in, in all of human history. I mean, when was the last time the Catholic Church formally allowed the blessing of same-sex couples uh, right. that were known to be engaging in sodomitical practices? I mean, this is, this is unprecedented. Uh, but you, you've got the, uh, the revolution of that very ideology at the very top of the Catholic Church. It's being propagated not only by various uh, cardinals and bishops in the Curia, but by the Pope himself. So, yeah, we live in completely unique times, and it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult to navigate. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's where we're at. So I guess I, uh, we're uh, we're going to be up at against a break here. But Michael Hitchborn is our guest. We're talking about the Lepanto Institute's reportage on the USCCB and 
And of course, they're laying off 50 percent uh, of that uh, social justice staff. And we're sort of reading between the lines a little bit and trying to figure out exactly why they're doing that. But, you know, I think it is a one one more piece of the puzzle to the entire picture here. And the lay faithful, they must stand up because clearly the bishops had an opportunity here to to say, you know what? All right. We tried that. It didn't work. The lay faithful don't like it. It is not well received. They're not giving us money, but they, they just didn't do that. They they spun this thing so they can keep going with this thing. Even without the staff, I think they will continue. Do you see that they'll they'll continue down this granting of these groups? Um, I'm not sure. To be honest, I, I actually don't know. Um, a, a lot of the uh, the hard leftists like National Catholic Reporter, Commonweal, America Magazine, they're screaming bloody murder. They think that this signals uh, a complete and total shift in what the USCCB is trying to do. Personally, I'd like to see an end to the USCCB itself. I don't see that it serves any real good anyway. Oof, that's a bigger deal. Hey, let's uh, pick up where we uh, left off right there. On the other side of the break, I'm going to ask everybody to do me a favor, though. Go to the thestationofthecross.com and check out that banner for our 25-year anniversary celebration in Niagara Falls. It's a conference. It's a gala dinner. Candace Owens is going to be there. She's going to tell, uh, share her journey, why she became Catholic. Praise be to God. Rem DeRorio is going to come. Bishop Strickland's going to be there. He's been... He's been a fire and a uh, just a an amazing witness in this time of confusion, and I'm excited to have him on the team. He's going to be here next week on the show, as a matter of fact, but he'll be in Niagara Falls. Mother Miriam, Father Mateg, myself, Jim Havens, and even producer Jake. Go to thestationofthecross.com for the details. We'll be right back with more from Michael Hitchborn. Don't go anywhere. Be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It's great to be on with you. Praise be to God. In spite of the fact that our all of our live video feeds crashed a minute ago, we're back up and running. Producer Jake is feverishly working like a, a squirrel, stirring away his nuts for winter just to keep all these spinning plates spinning, right? So uh, praise be to Jesus for that. And by the way, it's uh, July 1st, which means July 4th is this week. And it's the week that I have to say goodbye to my youth. So it's going to be a busy week. I'm going to be going on vacation, and uh, we're going to have a great opportunity for for uh, Mike Koeniger and producer Jake to fill in, and they're going to have wonderful conversations. We're going to have Eric on the team later. He is a, a Catholic artist. We're going to be talking about the Rupnik artwork. Dr. Harrelson is going to be here, and he's going to be talking about uh, Catholic migration history. It's going to be a lot of fun. So be sure to stick around. And, of course, July 4th, we won't be here. Well, we're going to be off, and uh, we're going to play some patriotic content for your liking if you are, in fact, still hanging around and going to work that day. But Michael Hitchborn is our guest. We've been talking about the uh, USCCB and their defense of the Catholic Campaign for Human Development. And, of course, the lay faithful's response to all of that seems crazy. And then, of course, they're laying off staff members, kind of reading between the lines. Michael Hitchborn, welcome back to the team. Um I, I do kind of want to stick at this sort of like bigger kind of where we're at level. Um, right now we're looking at, uh, you know, the, even 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 the Democrats right now, even the Democrats recognize Joe Biden is not mentally fit to be president. Duh. We've only been saying this for a long time now. I mean, it's like abuse. Watching them cart him out is a elder abuse. It's not right. They should not have done that. They've been doing it. They could. They apparently want to continue to do it to, in spite of the fact that the Democrats are looking for an opportunity to get rid of him. But apparently they can't remove him from some of the um, from some of the polls in some of the states, by the way. Now, they've sort of passed that that line. So it's very complicated situations. There's that. Then you have, of course, Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano accusing Pope Francis of not just being not the Pope, but being an anti-Pope. It's a bigger argument. It's a bigger deal. And then, of course, you have uh, bishops that are defending the Catholic Campaign for Human Development, despite the fact that they give them to groups that worship Satan or demons, let alone abortion. You have more people. You have abortion is killing 
more human beings now than any time in history. You got more people addicted to pornography now than any time in history. You have a total collapse of society on many levels. France had go had riots over the weekend. You got unrestricted migration coming over the border right now. The economy seems to be in in turmoil. Uh, inflation still remains incredibly high and getting worse by the day. We're always on the precipice of World War III. Michael, I'm going to ask you, what, what do we do? How, how, do we, how do we live in this great time of chaos and turmoil? Michael Hitchborn, hopefully we'll get your, get your audio back up. I'm not sure what happened there. Isn't that the case, though? It seems like anytime we want to have substantive conversation about these things, this is when the technical uh, demons start messing with stuff. That happened yesterday, as a matter of fact, when we were saying goodbye to one of our priests, beloved priest Father Rock, who is uh, also one of the Ask a Priest Live priests, was saying his final high mass at our parish as he's going to be making his way over to Nashua, New Hampshire, which, praise be to God, is Father Branch's parish, St. Stanislaus there, and uh, he's going to be the third priest in that location. So we're saying goodbye to him in Texas, and we're sending him up to New Hampshire, and what do you know, on the last high mass of Father Rock, the air conditioner goes out just as mass is starting and it is Texas, and it is hot in Texas. And poor Father Rock was just like in 82 layers of, of vestments, and it was sweating in the, the entire time. Michael, sorry about the uh, technical demons that want to mess with us. So I was trying to oh. ask you for your take on the level of chaos in society. What is your response? How do we live in this time? Ride the wave, my friend. Ride the wave. <laughs> uh, the, the truth of the matter is we've, we've got a tsunami of filth that is just resonating all over the world. Um, and what we have to do is, is you have to, you have to have the, the, the virtue of fortitude. Uh, you have to mm. have that stick with itness that's going to allow you to, uh, to get through that, that difficult time. Uh, St. Don Bosco, he had that vision of the, the, the ship with the two pillars and, the Pope was trying desperately to navigate the ship between those two pillars, but he was unable to do it. The subsequent Pope was the one that anchored uh, the ship to those two pillars, one being Our Lady and one being the Eucharist. Well, those are our anchors. Those are what we have to anchor ourselves to. And as long as we are chained to Our Lady and to the Holy Eucharist, well, there's nothing that's going to blow us aside. So it's that fortitude that we have to have, that stick to and... I think that once you do that, you can ride that wave and you won't be washed away. I saw that you recently celebrated 22 years uh, in your uh, anniversary and congratulations to you and your wife for that. Praise be to God. But I love what you said here. It says uh, 22 years, eight children, four different places to live that we've called home, six different career paths, good times and tough times, laughs and tears and a life of more love and adventure than anyone, any one man deserves. Well, uh, that is a beautiful statement, but it also kind of reminded me of the, sort of the answer, the, you know, to the times of chaos. Just exactly what you just said, that stick to itness. Men and women committed to each other sacramentally, raising a family in good times and in bad, and in sickness and in poor. And, and this is the time where we must persevere as families. We must live in a state of grace, pursue virtue, be obedient to our state in life. And I think we're coming into this time where labels will be bandied about, tossed about, schismatic, excommunicated, or whatever. You're, you're a heretic. You're the problem. Like, I feel like that's going to get a lot worse. And I feel like the lay faithful have to, again, live in a state of grace, pursue virtue, and almost ignore a lot of this chaos would you say that that's fair? I mean, not be ignorant to the issues and not do what's right. But at the same time, we, I don't think we can give it as much uh, bandwidth in our daily lives as we, we have maybe. Absolutely. A lot of people ask me how I'm able to continue doing what I do and look at the rot going on in the church. And the fact of the matter is it doesn't bother me because it doesn't actually touch me. Uh, if I were... Um, a sewer worker and my whole job was to make sure that the sewer pipes were clear. Sure. There's some filth that gets, you know, you, you get touched by filth, but you wash it off and you go back to work the next day and you continue to make sure that these sewer pipes are cleared so that people have clean water. And so they have uh, the, the ability to flush their filth down the toilets and that kind of thing. And it's difficult and uh, it's not 
ex- entirely fun, but at the same time, it's it's necessary, and I just it doesn't affect me personally because that's not me. That I'm mm. not I don't identify with the nastiness that's going on, and as long as I don't, then it's I don't feel the fatigue of having to fight against it. Um, yeah, you know, where's the where where's the balance between being aware of the situation or the the scandals in the church or outside the church. And then, of course, you know, just maintaining your peace. Well, uh, I think that anybody that wakes up in the morning and checks their weather app recognizes what they need to prepare for for the day. If you're going to look and see if you need to put on a raincoat or take an umbrella with you or, gosh, maybe I'll bring a T-shirt with me because it's going to be really hot. Uh, Whatever the situation, be aware of the weather, but don't obsess over it. You're not going to sit there and look at the weather app all day long going, gosh, is the weather going to change five minutes from now? No, you get a general sense of what's going on, and you go about your day. You don't look at the app again. Well, the answer is yes. It will change five minutes from now. I live in Texas. <laughs> Every five minutes, it's a new outlook. So we just don't even bother anymore at this point. Uh, the, the CCHD stories are going to be linked up in the show notes today, but I couldn't recommend enough just going over to Lepanto Institute's website, lepantoin.org. You'll find a tremendous amount of reporting on these stories going back years now with the receipts. Why exactly are there issues? And, you know, I think you can spend some time, quality time, reading these reports, getting the actual details of the accusations, looking at the actual details of how these groups hate the Catholic Church but still receive a lot of money from the USCCB through the CCHD program. And potentially, if God gives you an opportunity to have a conversation with your priest or your bishop, you might consider sharing that. LaPontoIN.org. We'll go into the after show next. God bless you, Michael Hitchborn. Thanks for being on the team. The Station of the Cross began broadcasting in Buffalo, New York in 1999. Since then, our listening areas have multiplied and expanded into several states. While our mission is to grow the Catholic faith through radio and other media outlets, our apostolate is supportive of but independent from your local diocese. Through your generosity, we are able to inspire countless listeners with the gospel and help lead them to a parish to be spiritually nourished by the sacraments. And we're back. Welcome to the After Show, everyone. Happy Monday. I feel like I have cognitive decline today for some odd reason. I feel like I've got the Joe Biden brain going on today. Uh, I can't get out of my own way for some odd reason. Damon, good morning to you. James 16897. Yvonne, good morning to you. Karen, Andy Bashaw, Paul, Mike K. Uh, Koeniger is going to be in the hot seat later this week. I'm excited because I'm not going to be. I'm going to be off. (laughs) <laughs> Kevin, good morning to you. Becky Hansen, good morning to you. Eileen, T. Storm, Jen Nugent. Jerome is here. Praise be to God. Good morning to you. Um, Sci-Fi Mike is even here. Praise be to Jesus. You know it's desperate when Sci-Fi Mike is on the Telegram group because he can't get access to his beloved rumbles because all of our feeds crashed. Good times, isn't it? Good times. I think Dr. Stein is back. Praise be to Jesus. Good morning to you, Dr. Stein. Thanks for hanging out with us. Good morning. I didn't wasn't sure if your after show had started yet or not. I always thought it was about <laughs> seven when it started. So oh, we're in the well, yeah. of, uh, we've got a lot we of started. we're we're getting ready for a road trip next week. And uh, we have appointments this morning to do and uh, it's garbage day and some <laughs> minor who minor renovations inside the house that we've got to make sure we take advantage of garbage day for. So it's kind of hectic this morning. And as a consequence, I can stay till seven 30 central. You got it. To leave. Well, praise okay. be to God. We're, we're grateful for whatever time you, you'll give us, especially since I asked last minute, I, <laughs> you know, it's awesome when you can text a guy at like five in the morning and say, Hey, can you be on the radio today? And he's like, sure. <laughs> like that's, that's reason, a level of coolness. Way, and the only reason I only I didn't see it until 30 minutes after you sent me the text was because I have to get ahead of my video production stuff for this road trip. And so the only things I can do ahead are like all those weekend videos no one ever watches. Right. Which I think are the most important thing I do, but no one watches them, which right. says a lot. Right. And then also the um, the like any prophecy kind of video that I'm making, I can do those way ahead of time because most of the time they're not exactly timely. So I be, I got to get a lot of that stuff done before we 
uh, before we leave because I planned a live stream from the road <laughs> on a laptop that I just bought, and it's going to be fun. So, well, I'll be doing one. I'm going on a road trip this week, and we leave Wednesday. We're going to go up through Arkansas down into Clear Creek Abbey. I'll be spending my birthday. At Clear Creek Abbey. I'm looking forward to it. I've never been to Clear Creek Abbey, but I've only heard wonderful things. I'm especially anxious to see the uh, set. It's like it's like 645, 650, 7 a.m., somewhere in there uh, when they say masses at all the altars at the same time. So really yeah, my understand, and excited to be about that. My understanding of that mass that, they're offer, that they offer, though, is I believe it's a transitional liturgy from the mid-60s. So, so I've, that's I've I, asked that's that what I've heard, I've asked that know. question. And what I've been told is it's the 62 uh, missile, but they do offer what they call a 65, which is that transitional one. Okay. So, but so that's so from, you're likely you're likely to see those side masses. Then those private private masses <laughs> are probably right. your 62. Exactly. Yes. And apparently, okay. apparently. So there's a main altar. And then there's an altar mm-hmm. behind that one. And apparently the abbot says his at the one behind. And all of that is going on at the same time. So you've got a bunch of masses being said all simultaneously. Very pumped and excited about that. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. But that's my road trip. I will, I will be doing one show from the road on Tuesday morning. We're going to be in Tyler, Texas. And so I'll, I'll do my show from the road there. Uh, and then we'll be back in the hot seat on Wednesday. But yeah, so road trips. It's uh, July 4th so this week, so it's a road trip season. Laura says, got my tickets for my birthday. I treated myself. Well, praise be to God, Laura. Do you, do you mean tickets to like the Niagara Falls deal? That's super cool. That'd be awesome. Praise be to God. Uh, good morning to you, Chris. Good morning to you. Uh, or Chris Stouffer. I like how you did that, Chris. I see where you're going with that cross in the middle there. Praise be to Jesus. Uh, he says, "Hi, Mass at 9 a.m. the Sunday after the Three Hearts was the 62." Yes. Good morning to you. Praise be to God, uh, Laura. So you're coming to Niagara Falls. That's awesome. From Canada. That's amazing. Praise be to Jesus. I'm glad to glad to uh, get a chance to meet you. That'll be wonderful. P- uh, Petrix, but I, I feel so old. I do feel like Joe Biden most days now that I'm 50 years old. It's just, it's, re- it's all going downhill very quickly at this point. Paul says, Tyler, are you seeing Bishop Strickland? I saw him a couple of weeks ago. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll have him on the show next week when I get back. He's, he's on the show. And then uh, I might be going on pilgrimage with Bishop Strickland next year. So they even invi- he's invited me, and I said yes, but hopefully it'll all work out. Um, probably to Greece and Turkey, I'm guessing. Which, by the way, persecution of the Christians in Turkey is taking an upswing these days. So... Ought to be very interesting. Uh, Petra, good morning to you. Jamie, good morning to you. Joey, good morning to you. Jay is on the team. Alex, good morning to you. Praise be to God. Yvonne, good morning to you. Debbie uh, Furtado, good morning to you, Debbie. Glad to see you back. Michael, good morning to you. Praise be to Jesus. Patricia, Lights 10, Helen Grace. Alberto, Angel Knight, good morning to the team here. Love seeing you guys on the team. Even even though we lost our, our stream, it crashed on us. Are we still streaming on Facebook? I see Lori over there, Junior Barra, Patty. Good morning to you, Jane. Good morning to you. Jane, we are praying for your your mom. She's in the hospital oh, with pneumonia. I, I, we'll be pr- I hate to interrupt. You, 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 uh, I need you to talk me out of something. You got it. I'm here you to are, serve. You're very, you are a very reasonable person who are much, who's much more measured than I am in your speech. Okay. You need to this convince me that it's a bad idea to live stream tomorrow on the topic of Cardinal Zen just nuking Michael Lofton from orbit. He literally <laughs> responded to Michael Lofton's critique of, of his takedown of Fiducia's supplicants. And, and Cardinal Zen, Cardinal Zen, let me just quote this to you. This was just posted by Please. Michael Haynes, the, the life site news reporter for on, right. On Twitter, he said, just in, Cardinal Joseph Zen penned strong rebuttal of Michael Lofton's critique of Cardinal Zen's analysis of Fiducia supplicants. Quoting Cardinal Zen directly, I must confess that I have often wasted my time following the program Reason and Theology of Michael Lofton, this big man with a little beard who would do well to hide his tattoo when he speaks like a theologian. I have been driven by curiosity to hear the hilarious nonsense he says. Oh, wow. (laughs) <laughs> wow. And, okay. Cardinal um, Zen. This is especially nasty coming from Cardinal Zen. I mean, nasty meaning effective yeah. because Cardinal Zen 
is universally liked. There isn't anybody except like where Peter is crowd who don't like Cardinal Zen. We're sure it was Cardinal Zen who said this. Like we're sure of that. It's his Here, Twitter feed. The link, like, the link yeah. goes right. to old Joseph dot dot com. That's all. That's his website. The okay. link goes there. Okay, hold you on. Let's. How do I get I'm going there? I'm going there, I'm going Go there right now. Feed. Go to Michael Haynes' feed. Michael uh, from Life Site News. Yeah, the Life Site Michael Haynes. Yeah, I, I love Michael Haynes. By the way, what a great guy! I'm I got okay, to hang out with him when I was in Rome. Fantastic human being. Really, really. I'm gonna put my. I'm gonna uh, Jake. I'm gonna put my uh, my desk up on so everybody can see this. Okay. So Michael Haynes. Justin, Cardinal Joseph Zen pens strong rebuttal of Michael Lofton's critique of Cardinal Zen's analysis of fiducia supplicans. I must confess um, that, that you, just as you just read it, it just whew, that is that is like Mike drop stuff right there. Like wow, right? Like I would be if, like you know. I have to say, there, if I, if I, because of the things I've said about Hollerick and a few of them, if he, if somebody like that penned something about me, I'd find it hilarious. But I don't oh, well, know. Yeah, if that's me my too. Favorite. Are you kidding? I mean, like, I mean, if I got the attention uh, of Gretsch or somebody like that, but this is this is no joke. That is because Cardinal Zen is universally nobody dislikes Cardinal Zen. Even that's a think spicy he's meatball right there. Like, wow. <laughs> Like I, I, my mind is blown that he's just like, all of a sudden, just coming out, just pff, mic drop, and then. But you know, Michael Lofton will make hay out of that all day long. He's gonna have, oh, he's maybe. gonna, he's gonna go live on that one, and he's gonna make get a big audience out of it, and he's gonna have a a, a, a heyday with it. Is what's gonna happen. But Cardinal Zen, he is the real deal, man. Uh, he's an amazing man. Praise be to God. And if he's saying that. Like he doesn't like you don't he doesn't he he doesn't criticize anybody. And not really. He doesn't even criticize Pope Francis that much. Not really. Like the worst things he's ever said is not even co- close to being as uh, edgy as this. Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. And the problem is I made a promise to God that I would not use my platform on YouTube or my podcast to stir the pot with other Catholic content creators. Yeah, I don't like doing that either. Well, I kinda have, yeah, so I kind of. Might have to ignore this thing, other than this conversation we're having here, or just well, I'm. It's news. It's or a news just, item. Just give it news. news. I will. Yeah, just be like, this is a letter. Him critiquing Michael Lofton. I offer this without further comment, and just right. <laughs> read the yeah, thing. I mean, <laughs> like my, my opinion of of Michael Lofton. Who cares? Like pff, nobody cares. Michael right. Lofton doesn't even care. Like what I think if you want to watch know. Michael Lofton, that's your business. I don't. I don't care. Right. I, I yeah. have no opinion on what he does because I purposely. But don't when pay Cardinal to Zen says something, it's like it's a different ball game. It's news. It's a news Cardinal item. Zen addressed a YouTuber. Okay. <laughs> right. I mean, let that sink in for a second. That's where we're at right now, where YouTubers are are having a conversation at such a scale that princes of the church at his age are paying attention. Mm -hmm. That is, that blows my mind. That blows my mind. I haven't reached the level of having a Vatican assigned uh, (laughs) operative to review my content, but you probably have. So uh, hopefully I don't know about that. I, I am aware that there are bishops who watch my show, but they've all, they're all anonymous. That's it. Other than Bishop Meikle of the, the traditional group that, rejected vatican one or at least rejected they acknowledge vatican one they acknowledge the papal infallibility thing but there's some hang up they have with it whatever that group is whichever old or old roman or old catholic i can never keep them straight he's the only bishop that i know by name who watches me but beyond that i know that there are others but they they're all anonymous and i always guarantee whenever a priest sends me a uh like inside tip that i will guarantee their anonymity because obviously why wouldn't you <laughs> Yeah. Well, uh, okay. So we, we, uh, you asked for a voice of reason. Okay. So Becky has stepped up to provide the voice of reason for the two of us okay. who have gone absolutely giddy over the Cardinal Zen comment. <laughs> she says, wait the 24 hour rule, the 24 hour rule, wait 24 hours for more information than report the Cardinal Zen topic. Right. I would, I wouldn't put, talk about this publicly till to my live stream tomorrow morning. And that's close enough to 24 hours. Right? So, yeah. if Michael Lofton is going to respond. He will respond today. I guarantee you, Michael Lofton will probably try to. to go live. 
Oh, if happen. he's not already, if he hasn't done it already, I can check. I mean, I'm, I'd be surprised. I, he's pretty quick at that stuff. He's pretty. If quick. he's up this early, seven in the morning, right? Well, we're men. Men are usually get out of bed early, right? I mean, ask, right, ask producer but, Jake. I he's mean, up early. Let's see. Does he have a video yet? No, the last video was three days ago. He's not live right now. So, but it's seven in the morning. For all I know, he could be, you know, having a workout right now, reading the news, doing whatever it is yeah. he does in this morning. Do it, going to mass. I mean, you know, who knows? I... Joey, are you saying Michael Lofton is a set A? Um, I, I, no, I don't Lofton believe. Is not a set, he is definitely not a set, not a set A. He, no. He's one of the guys who hurls that term around. Right. He he's, would probably uh, think, I'm a set A. <laughs> right, no, well, I, I'm not. It's more likely but... that Michael Lofton thinks that you and I and your audience here are set A's. All set A's, yeah. Set A's, set A's <laughs> yeah. for you, and set A's for you, and you're a set A. And you're, I mean, but I think that's kind of where we're at. We're, we're going to be there. You know, it's like uh, uh, our, our Archbishop Lefebvre. Like, he yeah. had to live with the, the title excommunicated till he died, right? Um, yeah. And now, of course, his reputation is being re- rehabilitated. I think a lot more people see him more favorably now as a result. But I think that's the time where the average parishioner is going to be caught in this war, the civil war, and they're going to be called schismatic and heretic and excommunicated and all the rest. And they're going to have to live with that, the, the uncomfortableness of those terms and just be at peace and have faith that they are faithful Catholics because mm-hmm. we are, you're, you're basically being ushered into two camps. You're either hundred percent on this camp or you're hundred percent on that camp. You're never going to be allowed that middle ground. Whereas um, I think we take that middle ground and we say, no, I'm a faithful Catholic, but I'm clearly saying that this is wrong and I'm not going to be put into that bucket. Thank you. But no, you know, uh, but that, that's where mm-hmm. we're at. They, you're not, you're not going to be allowed to have that nuanced position. Speaking of Lofton, wasn't he king of nuance? <laughs> Dude, didn't all, I know wasn't is, his thing? I, all I know is that Michael Yabara doesn't associate with him anymore. Oh yeah. I, I listened to Michael Yabara's, uh, podcast what was that like three months two months ago three months ago or something like that where he talked about how he and uh, michael lofton went separate ways michael lofton rejected yabara's uh, um answer though r- response or his his version of things michael lofton claims that wasn't true but um yeah i don't again it to me a lot of that a lot of this the drama that comes out of of these content creators it just feels dramatic and high school cafeteria like and i'm like guys mm-hmm. like grow up man like we like this yeah. is silly. It just feels silly I, I for try the to, most part. I try to avoid the drama myself because there's no yeah. point to it. It's one of the reasons I, I if I report on this, I'm gonna be like, I'm not going to present this with any comment. Here's what Mike Cardinal Zen said. Yes, and then we'll right. move Without on comment. The That's right. <laughs> Simply a news item, people. I'm just reporting the news. That's all I'm doing. Oh man. Make yeah. your own, it, draw your own it, conclusions it, from the most universally like vision of the church. <laughs> Good grief. I, I, I gotta I'm gonna be honest with you though. Okay, so I'm going to read this statement again. You just read it. I'm going to read it again. Quote, quote, I must confess that I have often wasted my time following the program Reason and Theology of Michael Lofton. This big man with a little beard who would do well to hide his tattoo when he speaks like a theologian. I have driven by curiosity. I have been driven by curiosity to hear the hilarious nonsense he says close quote i'm gonna be honest with you and i gotta i gotta tell you i have a i just that does not sound like cardinal zen to me well here's how we can check we can go to the link because the link is his website like i can see that that is his website i've been to his website many times he says i am accused of not following the hermeneutic of continuity when criticizing fiducia supplicants and it opens right on his website with that paragraph you just read, except it goes more than that. He says, I've been driven by her curiosity to hear, to hear the hilarious nonsense he says. This time, however, I saw that he was criticizing me. With great seriousness, he is scandalized that I, who insists so much on the hermeneutic of continuity, now dare to criticize fiducia supplicants. And then he gives a date for the broadcast without a link. This means that Mr. Lofton does not even know how to distinguish the different value of pronouncements that come from Rome. <laughs> It just goes on. <laughs> it's, it's his website. That's big. It's huge. I mean, that's so rough. I mean, I feel bad for Lofton now a little bit, to be honest. I'm like, wow. I would be, 
I'd be I'd be so crushed, I, you know, if uh, Cardinal Zen said that about me. This is what I would doesn't. expect people to save me if I ran around reporting on every single alleged mystic and prophet that self-described prophet who runs around out there, whether they've got a collar on or not. You know, yeah. every alleged message from heaven as it comes out. That's what I would expect people to save me if I did that. It's yeah. you know, I get questions why didn't I cover fill in the blank mystic that people really like right now, or Father Rodriguez or whoever. All these people, I'm like. Because they're current. I have a rule. Don't, you know, they're current. If it's a news item, I'll report on it like once. And then I'm, but I'm not going to give you any yeah. more messages because I, I had Father Rodrigo on. I, I actually aired his, uh, it was like, it was like kind of like a press conference is the way I looked at it. You know, it was, it was, it mounted to three hours though, uh, of his uh, message last week. And a lot of Catholics did appreciate me airing it. But, you know, and as I said after, I don't, um, we talked about this for, I guess it was Friday. Was it Friday? Mm-hmm. We did it Friday. Yeah. Um, you know whether whether you like him or hate him or love him or whatever we just we heard him out and we uh, you know you can draw your own conclusions based on that. But I do find it very That's interesting it. because I do see a lot of dots connecting right now from a lot of different circles, not just the, and that was the point that I wanted to illustrate was just that there are a lot of people from various walks of life all kind of saying the same thing right now. I think we should pay attention to that personally. I think we should pay attention to that. I think you don't have to be a prophet. Uh, uh, or, a, or a genius to come to some conclusions about what's going on in the world today. And if we don't react to to that with greater holiness and piety and then acts of reparation being the, the big key takeaway, then woe mm-hmm. unto us because, man, the signs, the signs are, are many and, uh, and they're coming sure, hot and heavy these days. I just I don't trust Father Rodriga because I paid attention four years ago when he said that Trump would lose the election. Well, literally, if you paid attention to any number crunchers in the week before that election, they said the same thing. Right. But he also said civil war would happen right afterwards, which well, I hope never happens. Well, he said 2020. So, yeah, yeah well, he's right happens. now. It's, all the, all now the, it's the, talking third I'll world war. Right. And everybody's talking about third world war right now. And right, I don't well, want I, third I, world I, war I, to I, happen. I, Right. And I said on Twitter when somebody asked me about this, I'm like, well, if he said third world war, it makes me feel a little more comfortable that we're probably not going to have it then because I, I don't trust. I hope people. so. I hope we don't. Because I don't you're, want you're, that. You're, you're, supposed so a, you're supposed to have a pretty high hit rate as a, to be taken seriously as a mystic. And he did. Yeah. Compared to a lot of others, he doesn't. Um, so that's why I don't pay attention to the church rule on it, which now thanks to Cardinal Fernandez and Pope Francis, that's never going to happen. Because they don't believe in, in, in reporting on miracles. Which, by the way, how is this going to affect canonizations? Yeah, because buddy. think about it. <laughs> but then again, they, they invented like a whole third category of uh, of for cat, for canonizations. Like it's not just you know you're a you know miracle working saint, but it's also you can be a you know have the red crown of martyrs, right? Those are kind of the classic ones. But then there's a third one now that I think means that they had like the right stuff, basically. According to the Pope canonizing it, it's that's why I don't know. know. I, we've talked about this in the past. Um, I just believe the canonization process is in, in very political system. Very, it's about lobbying for your your guy or your gal, and mm. you know it's about who you know and your power play and all the rest. That's not to say that. You know, well, I'll just use Carlo Acutis as an example. It's not to say that Carlo Acutis wasn't a great good Catholic boy. I mean, I, I don't know. I didn't, I don't know him, but I mean, I'm sure he was, I'm sure he was great. I like, I I almost want to put him to the side and say, it's not about him personally. It's about the system. So Carlo Mm. Acutis gets, gets, uh, gets the, the canonization, but Miguel pro still isn't like that seems lopsided and weird to me. I, I, my mind can't Mm. understand this. Like I, I call her Acutis. Praise be to God. I'm sure he was a wonderful faithful, pious Catholic who loved, madly loved with the Lord and Savior Jesus and praise God for that. But it just, the system seems weird. It doesn't, it doesn't seem straightforward that way. You know, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And, uh, this, and I, it, you can't have escape the perception that of that, of that going back to when they changed the rules on this in 1983 or 85 or whenever it was. When the number of the number of miracles got changed, the elimination of the devil's advocate. I mean, let me put it to you this way: I remember distinctly watching Michael Matt reporting on the canonization of Pope Paul VI, and him laughing the whole way through it because there was no cultus for Paul VI. Right. There were right. 
there was apparently one for John the 23rd. There were people who held a special where he, you know, they had a special place in their heart for him, but nobody for Paul the sixth, nobody like <laughs> this. And then when you look in, in, in the more like bird's eye view, all of a sudden, what do you have? You have John the 23rd, Paul the sixth, John Paul the second, all canonized. And now a process for, for John Paul the first, for some reason, not right. worthily, by the way, they've said we're going to we should wait 50 years at least for Benedict the 16th. Well, that's convenient. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I say that as someone who's very that's nuanced, so funny. Look, I yeah. have a very nuanced position on Joseph Ratzinger, as it broadly speaking, but yeah. it's convenient. <laughs> so, yeah, JP1 definitely gets the nod. Benedict the 16th, well, I don't know. <sighs> let's just wait a while. Like, okay, let's go back to waiting a while. Probably a good idea. Probably a good idea. Mm -hmm. Petra asks, isn't it because of the recent a miracle associated with Carlo Acutis? Um, you know, if there are legit miracles, and I hope they are, don't get me wrong. Um, praise right, God. That's another, thing that's got, that's another thing that's gotten a lot of a question and not, well, Carlo Acutis himself. So but I, I do want to just be careful and just say, yeah, I want to separate the person Carlo Acutis from my commentary on it he, because I don't, he seems I, don't like a good I can't, kid, but I don't know. <laughs> I have no personal knowledge of, of his life or whatever. And all I'm saying is I'm just illustrating to say, listen, I, I, I can be completely fine with a St. Carlo Acutis, it, but the trouble is it doesn't make, like, it seems when you look at the whole, you're like, Hmm, this is, the system seems lopsided. It doesn't seem like clear cut and, and obvious. You get Carlo hmm. Acutis, you get John the 23rd, Paul the 6th, JP1, Benedict has to wait 50 more years. I mean, JP2, there's things I love about JP2. Don't get me wrong. But then there's things I'm like, wait, what? Like, what are we talking about? The whole Assisi thing, that is a, a, a major, major problem. If you had Assisi a devil's thing. advocate involved in this, you they would have zeroed in on Assisi. Because Assisi right. was, I didn't want to remind people of this. Assisi was the original Pacamama before yeah, this Pacamama. Exactly, was the Assisi conference. And so I mean, was it two weeks after, two weeks after the Assisi conference, was it an earthquake yeah. destroyed that par that parish or right. something? Like, exactly. Let that sink in. Guys. Like, <laughs> God's not going to be mocked. Um, that does, but okay, that doesn't mean that JP two couldn't have repented and his life made valid, made a really great confession, done private penances. Well, I you know that we no don't know about, about JP 2s final destiny whatsoever. Right, exactly. Uh, I, I, that's I guess the point that I'm sure. making. But but again, I, I use Miguel Pro as my uh, sort of my example in this conversation to say it's obvious the man forgave his his murderers before they murdered him. And he, and he clearly his dying breath was Viva Cristo Rey. So if that – he's definitely a martyr for the faith. Why doesn't he become St. Miguel Pro? That makes no sense to and, me. And an example close to my wife's heart is the priests on the Titanic who yeah, purposely gave the spots they were offered to other people yep. and were absolving people's sins right to their last right. – Exactly. And so – that's heroic virtue, which used to be one of the main hallmarks for it. There right. is a cultist out there too, by the way. There are people out there pushing for their canonization. And I say this as someone who is not a fan of every attempt to canonize Catholics that we admire. Let me give you an example. I love G.K. Chesterton, and I do not support mm. the cause for his canon. Because yeah. I will tell you, as someone who struggles with obesity, there is a virtue problem there. And mm. his friend Hilaire Belloc candidly said, it was probably his love of beer and cheese that killed him. <laughs> I love I mean, cheese too, man. I do not drink beer. Uh, I don't drink it all anymore. But uh, boy, do I love some cheese. I could, I could crush right. some cheese right now if I, if I had it in front of me. Uh, and as, <laughs> famously, as, a guy, as a guy who uses Hilaire Belloc as his mascot on his channel, I would probably not support the cause for canonization of Hilaire Belloc either. Not against okay. on, on any so, on virtue ground. I just don't believe in every Catholic that we admire. Unless you have yeah. really good reason to believe that they're in the that they're in heaven, should actually have a cause for canonization. They should but, never and, be a and that know, should be the, the key right there. there. That should be one of the keys right there. You know, we're, we're trying to make a definitive statement about them being in heaven, right? And yeah. um, and it, it gets complicated at best anymore. And it feels very political and very, you know, just like the swamp watch. You know, like the 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 group that has the mm -hmm. most power, influence, and money. To get their guy or gal through the process wins. That should not be the way it is, in my opinion. 
Even if the guy right. or gal is great, even if the guy or gal is great, it just shouldn't work that way. I mean, Pius the tenth, we call him saint, yet he smoke a pack a day and he changed the divine office, which might have led Pius the twelfth to change the fifty five Easter liturgy, which might have been used as an excuse by the Bugnini crew to go full on nuclear war on the liturgy with what we call today the Novus Ordo. So, I mean, sure, but. I- there are there are so there are miracles associated with St. Pius X, though. I know, I know. I'm just I'm throwing jabs because I knew Jake would I'd probably trigger Jake. But, that's what I was going But for. here's no, the deal though, with that. Think about this one. All the Pope's conciliar popes canonized. There's even a talk now for doing the same for Pius XII. But between like fifteen seventy and nineteen oh five, whenever Pius X came to the throne of Peter, noteworthily, there are only two popes from that period who got canonized. And they're the ones I just named, St. Pius V and Pope Pius X. Uh, Not to say that some make the case for Leo XIII, show me the miracles is all I'm saying, or show me the, the extraordinary heroic virtue, or make the case that he was martyred somehow, even though he reigned for, what, sh- shortly less time than John Paul II did. A long time. To show me the case. Right. And he, was, he reigned for a long time at a time when he, that was needed. In the aftermath of Pius yeah. IX. He, we he love Leo was, XIII, though, right? Leo XIII was I'd amazing. Mar- I admire him greatly. That's why I have yeah. like a third of his encyclicals on my YouTube channel. Yeah, but his again, his, his writing is so good. Very. You know, if you very want to call good. him a servant of God or the rest of it, okay, no argument. Canonization is different, though. Part of the reason I get this bothers me so much is all the people we try to canonize. What if they're in purgatory and need your and need your prayers? All these, right. You know. And the reason people say it, because it should be an infall- part of infallibility and when a pope declares this, although technically never defined as such, technically. Mm-hmm. But Archbishop Fulton Sheen, have- I, I love Archbishop Fulton Sheen, but the last things he was saying in interviews were very troubling, <laughs> just like yeah. very troubling. You're just like, what mm-hmm. happened here? Like, please stop. Please, please. I think you got broken by the system personally. I think you got worn out, worn out by the system. And, the, you know, the uh, the the. Um, Never air your dirty laundry kind of routine from the from uh, from church, from the church, the hierarchy of the church. They're very used to that. He was definitely on that team. No matter what happened to him behind the scenes, he just didn't air that publicly. He was a very, he was a team player. But I'm not willing to throw Archbishop Fulton Sheen out out. It's like to, for the same reason I don't throw Origin out, right? <clears throat> Origin uh, so, didn't die a saint, but his his writing is amazing. We love it. But we all we have this conversation because they changed the rules in such a way in the 1980s yeah. that it just opened the floodgates for all these canonizations on top of the crisis in the church already, on top right. of the new ecclesiology, on top of all the chaos, the dia- all under that diabolic disorientation umbrella. Yeah. That's why we have these conversations. And that's why people don't immediately get offended by them most of the time. And it's also why people might, you know, like sort of trad Catholics might be like, oh, Carlo Acutis, you know, like – what if he is really legit, like a, a fantastic mm-hmm. Catholic? Like, like what if he was truly holy and virtuous, and and absolutely worthy of being called a saint? But we're questioning yeah, what if it. He's a better, <laughs> what if he's a better you know, Catholic than any of the people criticizing his canonization? Which right. might be the case. <laughs> which definitely could <laughs> be the so. case. But the point is, we're calling into pro- the question the process, which is not his fault, right? Like he had nothing to do with any of that. But because it feels like he's being used as a poster boy for 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 some within the Vatican's and their agenda, it just you know it feels off putting. Just it just feels very off putting. Yeah. But um, I don't know. I don't know what to, I, poor Carlo. I I even hate to like criticize the kid. Like I feel I feel like a horrible human being for criticizing a young Catholic boy. Who, you're uh, not had criticizing a love, him. You're, love for the Lord. You're not criticizing him. You're not. You're not trying to hit him with his love for video games and whatever else people say. <laughs> right. yes. you're, you're going after the people who elevated him. Yeah. With under the new system, and really, you're going after the new system for canonization because the yeah. new system for canonization. The only time I've seen the Vatican deviate from that at all was Mother Teresa when they brought in Christopher Hitchens of all people to be the right. devil's advocate, which is because they didn't call him a devil's advocate because traditionally the devil's advocate was. A Catholic, typically a bishop or a priest or a cardinal, whose job it was was to dig up all the dirt on the person and try to make the case that they weren't a saint. And then afterwards, they would go to penance and go to confession afterwards because they had to basically slime the person. That was their job. And uh, Christopher Hitchens isn't Catholic or wasn't. 
No. You know, he, he's, one of, he's one of those figures that I listen to him talk about secular politics from the time. I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, I don't got a problem with what you're saying. And then he brings the church in and then he just. Yeah. He was. <laughs> a lot of uh, people was, like that out there. Was it Christopher H- H- Hitchens? Reese, Re- is he the who, which one died? I forget which one of these atheists died. Christopher Hitchens is the one who died. And who's the his other brother? One? His brother is Peter Hitchens, a famous uh, Anglican commentary commentator in uh, the UK. But the other ones are Richard Dawkins, who recently Dawkins. said some things about Thank Dawkins, you. who recently like, yeah. blew the minds of a lot of atheists, his fans. By he saying, wants the Chris. <laughs> he wants Christendom back, but he doesn't want Chris Christ. He just wants Christendom because he doesn't like well, what's happened to his country. Recognizing the consequences of your actions is the first way to fix yeah. the problem, and. So that's a good sign that he's that and he's not the only one. I've heard a lot of like the people who are inspired by him in the last few years go from being angry liberals to actually being very conservative and saying, yeah, I might still be an atheist, but um, I'd rather live in a, uh, I'd rather live in a, Christ, a hardcore Christian country as long as it's not a full on theocracy than what we have now. <laughs> so yeah. there's movement. And so maybe pray for the conversion of all the people who are like that in the public eye. But especially can you imagine if Richard Dawkins converted. Yeah, I mean, any, I any kind of conversion, even if, even if it was like he became Anglican or something. I mean, can you imagine? Yeah. The kind I would love would to see. Do? I would love to see Joe Biden repent before he loses all cognitive capability for his own sake. I'd love to see Nancy Pelosi repent. I'd love to see a lot of Catholics uh, that are, are and, and non-Catholics. Of course, Richard Dawkins would be an amazing Joe Rogan. You know, let's go, Joe. It's time to make that leap of faith, make that leap of faith in the right direction. Right. Uh, I see Russell Brand moving in that direction and praise God for it. But well, we we still have we're still on a journey. Candace Owens, you know that she's still on her journey. Praise be to God. We're all on our journey, but yeah, yeah. it's like Maybe now or never. Pray for the, the repentance and conversion of Jill Biden, the woman who is most single handedly responsible for the elder abuse that oh. the whole country is being. Oh my! How do you, because how and, do you and figure that? Tell you this, my, my my political biases aside, which wants Joe Biden to stay in that race for as long as possible, I, I will tell you right now, it's absolutely reprehensible what they're doing to him. But how? Oh, it's simple. There are people who know more about Joe Biden than the rest of us. She loves the access, and she is essentially the de facto president, a la uh, Woodrow Wilson's wife at the end, and as rumored, uh, even Eleanor Roosevelt. Right? She's she's become that. You know, I know. I, I saw a, I saw a picture of her sitting at the president's desk on uh, on Air Force One, mm-hmm. and oh, she's one signing these documents. And like, <clears throat> she's in charge right now, which is part of the reason why Kamala Harris is probably so upset that she's not getting the nod because Jill's basically the first, you know, de facto female president in the United States. So and, this uh, morning there was a. Uh, so this morning Kamala Harris has a meeting with all of her staff. I know. I, I read my, it on the on the show. Suspicion. It looks like Bill O'Reilly's reported that, in despite the fact that uh, the uh, the Biden family met in Maine to try to discuss what they wanted to do, Hunter Biden pushed his dad to stay in the race. Golly, Julius, I wonder why. Could it be that Hunter Biden might need his dad's, you know, executive <laughs> pardon soon? I don't know. Maybe, but well, uh, nonetheless, is, um, Bill O'Reilly saying that he's dropping out. Joe Biden has to be the one to do it himself. But here's the problem. If he drops out, that means immediately the Republican Party can do the smartest thing they've ever done, which will be in Congress to invoke the 25th Amendment and try to get him removed, putting Kamala Harris as the incumbent. Well, Kamala Harris okay. is the only person alive less like than Joe Biden. <laughs> oh, I know. It's going to be great. But the, oh, we're, we're, out of, we're, we're out of time for you. You're going to have to go. But let me put this yeah. one last log on the fire here, and that is – I saw another report that said there are several states that have already come out and said it is too late to take Biden off mm-hmm. the ticket in their states. So even if he's not on the on the on the ticket, whomever they put, they're going to have to do a write in campaign. And how successful are write in campaigns? And, and those states, by the way, are Wisconsin and Nevada, which are swing states. Yeah. And the other deadlines from most of, the other, most of those other swing states are coming up. So I will tell you this much. It's, they're likely to just focus on the House and Senate. Oof. Because we that's live, the they have left. We live in and such Democrats interesting like, times. And the numbers aren't on their side for that either. Oh, uh, <laughs> we, Weakened at the Biden, says Laura. Weakened at the Biden. All that while Cardinal Zinn does a mic drop on Michael Lofton. Man, oh man, what's going to happen tomorrow, Anthony Stein? Like, what what headline will we read tomorrow? Can you? I mean, I almost can't wait to see what happens next. <laughs>
<laughs> we live in a world yeah. where uh, the Biden family is the weekend at the at the Bernies and, uh, and Cardinal Sin is Mike Ruff and Michael Lofton. So bizarre. God love you. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Sin, for hanging out with us again today. We'll see you guys right back here tomorrow morning. Until then, God love you.